Now, you're starting to get it. It's in Christ alone. It's in Christ alone. You're starting to get it now. You're getting it. It takes a while. For you alone, Jesus, we declare your glory and we thank you. Amen. You should stand for the whole service. Thank you, Lana. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, voices, for singing. Thank you, instruments, for playing. Thank you. Everybody give that crew behind you a round of applause upstairs, down below, the sound people. Thank you, everyone. Amen. Thank you, Brian Calloway. You started getting a little excited tonight. Bobby, woo, you started getting a little bit excited. I like it. It's still in there, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bobby and Becky are returning to Africa next week. They were going to be serving the rest of their lives there. No. It's on the video. They're going to go, oh, my goodness, I heard. No. no, that was very powerful tonight. Thank you, both of you, for pouring out the testimony of the Lord in your lives. Oh, the next steps. Church, you'll hear more. The reason they're standing there and telling you that is because you as a church are going to get on this thing. Okay? I say, what does that mean? You'll find out. You'll find out. But hallelujah and glory to God. Amen. We're going to go a little bit further and continue in his word, continue in his grace, continue in his love. You'll find all three of those in the Bible. Two of them in the Gospel of John, one of them in the Acts of the Apostles. We're going to continue. That was going to be the theme of the conference, but I like this one. This one's pretty good. In Christ alone. Mario. Where did you go? Where's Mario? Gosh. Mario, thank you for being here. Please stand. Please stand. Vance family, please stand. Please stand. Come on, stand up. Come on. Come on. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Brian, please stand up. Bobby, please stand up. Please. Please. We want to honor you and thank you for sharing the mission work of God in your lives. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much. We honor you and we honor where honor is due. We give it, of course, most of all to Jesus, but we thank you. Mike Matovich, where'd you go? We just, just give us a wave. Thank you, Mike, for being here with us. What a blessing you are. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for all that you have contributed. D, thank you, my brother. Thank you so much. Our worship and the time we've had in the Lord and singing praises and and uh, we're continuing in that. Thank you, Lana. One little cough drop. Amen. I guess we got to get on to things. Here we go. Uh, I will keep this brief, but I can't thank you enough for being here. You know that. You won't let me do anything for you. But uh, there's no one like Jesus, and there's no one like George Grace. And George and I knew each other for a lot of years, but more, of course, is just friends and co-laborers. And I just watched him from afar as pastoring people and shepherding. And over the last few years, God's used this man and many others, but uh, in particular, to really just change the trajectory of ministry in my life and help me to understand what it means to really shepherd people and to love them unconditionally, and uh, I thank you. I know the Lord and the Word and the Spirit of God, and my Savior has done it all, but you have done so very much, and uh, I can't thank you enough, and uh, you can still preach a little bit. Why don't you come and preach to us? I thank you so much. Pastor George Grace. Thank you. Thank you, too, brother. I appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. That's good, Pastor. That was good to, you know, everybody in this, everybody in this room really deserves thanks because you have been part of something very, very important for your church and very important for the Lord. So, if we wouldn't run out of, <clears throat> we wouldn't run out of people to thank here tonight if we really went around. And we thought of all of the components, all of the elements that come into a week like this. It, uh, it's incredible. Thank you 
for making this orderly and yet fun. Sometimes orderly isn't fun, you know what I mean? But it's been orderly, it's been organized, it's been neat, it's been clean, and at the same time, people have had smiles on their faces and lots of talking, and people have come early for church, and we've had great missionary testimonies and, and displays, missionaries telling us what God is doing in and through their lives. It's just been a wonderful, wonderful time. I'm thankful, thankful for a lot of reasons. I'm thankful for your pastor. We have, uh, because of our, um, our relationship, our video relationship, uh, that's tied us together quite a bit. By the way, I will be back next week. What night will I be here? Monday night, Monday night I'll be here next week. It, we picked up two new students. How many did you lose? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's a wash. Okay, uh, it's a wash. Anyway, but uh, uh, I'll be back next Monday night on video for apologetics. So I hope that uh, those of you that are in the class that you're getting something out of it. One of the first things that I said on Sunday morning <clears throat> was that we are here to be better, okay? That the church, by the time we walk out of here on Wednesday night, the church is better than what the church was on Sunday morning when we all rolled out of bed and came in here. Now, that's really ultimately up to you whether or not you're going to be better. Um, let me ask you, let me ask you a, a question. And you don't have to raise your hand, but I want you to think about it and raise your hand mentally. How many of you think that you personally, individually, could be better in your Christian life. There's room for improvement. Think of it, don't raise your hand. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. But there's room for improvement. Think about that. Is there or isn't there? Don't raise your hand. Okay. Now I'm going to say if you were honest with yourself, and I'm being honest with myself, I would say yes. Of course there's room for improvement. I'm not perfect, and I'm going to assume that most, if not all, of you said the same thing. But here's, here's a more difficult question. How many of you really want to be better? It's one thing to say I could be better. It's another thing to say I want to be better. Because that means that you have to put some kind of an effort in to get to that next level, whatever that level is. How many of you, no, again, don't raise your hand, want to be better? Now, the goal of my message tonight is just that. If right now you're kind of neutral about that, the answer to that question, kind of going, mm, I don't know, you know, I've heard this stuff before. I know, I've heard, I've, you know, I've preached a lot of sermons, I've heard a lot of sermons. I haven't always been the preacher, believe me, I've heard thousands of sermons, probably as many sermons as I've preached, I've heard other people preach. So I've sat where you sat and listened to the challenges of preachers and asked myself when they asked an honest and serious question, you know, how should I or how will I respond to that question? Do you really want to be better? I want you to open your Bible tonight, if you would, to Philippians chapter number three. And of course, our theme is in Christ alone. So we're picking out another, another passage of Scripture that uh, deals very clearly and very specifically with the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter number 3. Now I'm not going to take the time that I did last night to establish the, the context of the book and all that. I did that in our message last evening and I think I went a little bit long as I looked at the clock toward the end. So I'm going to skip that. I could take five or ten minutes to introduce the book and kind of give you the purpose for the book, who wrote it, when, why, where, all those, uh, those things. I'm not going to do that tonight. Because the passage of Scripture that I, we're going to look at is one that's very familiar. I could preach this message from several different perspectives. And I'm going to choose this one because I think... <clears throat> Most of you can identify with, with this, although it doesn't sound like that I'm addressing the theme in Christ alone. This, this is what I, I would, this is how I could uh, entitle this message. 
how to be a winner. How to be a winner. Now, I can go back to the last question. How many of you want to be better? You know, it's one thing to say, I could be better. How many of you want to be better? How many of you want to be a winner? It anything. What does it take to be a winner? Now, I know there's people in here tonight that are winners. They're very accomplished individuals in the area of their expertise. And, uh, you know, I think of, of course, Mark and, and Bobby, particularly because of their um, professional baseball careers. Not everybody plays professional baseball. You have to be something special to get to that level, to be in the major leagues, or probably to, to get hired by anybody to play baseball. You have to be a pretty good baseball player. But I'm going to guarantee you that what I'm going to say tonight in How to Be a Winner, that both of these men and probably countless other people in here that are winners, maybe you're a winner in the area of education. Maybe you're a winner in the area of finances. Maybe you're a winner in the area of your family. You can stand back and look at your family and say, you know, God has really blessed me. God has used me and my wife, me and my husband to build a wonderful family. So being a winner isn't confined to being a baseball player, a football player, a, you know, a, a sports nut. It can be in any area of life. How can you be a winner? Now, I know this. You got to be better. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to have a desire to be better, to be a winner. That's how you become a winner. Now, the Bible is certainly a book of theology, but it's also a book of philosophy. It's even a book of psychology, and I use the term in a good sense. I know some of you, when I say psychology, you know, you kind of wince. There's a Syracuse University professor several years ago and he was a psychologist, he said, psychology is the disease it professes to cure. Now, there's a, there's a lot of truth in that, isn't, isn't there? Um, oftentimes, people who gravitate towards psychology classes are people who have lots of problems. They're thinking that if they could go to a psychology class, that the teacher is going to straighten them out. The problem is that the psychology teachers became psychology teachers because they had lots of problems, and they probably still haven't... Never mind. I'm sure there's a psychology teacher in here. Anyway, the, the Bible is a book of, of theology. It's a book of history. It's a book of psychology also. And you're going to see that in this text. We're going to pick up Philippians chapter 3, verse number... Let's look at verse number 10. Or no, let's look at verse number... Tw no, yeah, let's start in 10. That I may, Paul is writing, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Look at verse 12 and think about what he's saying here. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Join me in prayer. Father, Thank you. What a, what a precious book, once again, as we have the privilege to open this, to read it, and to contemplate on what you are trying to communicate with us. Lord, I pray that you will help me to communicate a message tonight that will bring a challenge to each and every person. We all could be better than we are. But how many of us really want to be better? I really don't know, but I hope by the time we're done here tonight that we would have that desire and we too would be 
winners. We would strive to be winners and follow the recipe that's laid out so plainly and clearly right here in Philippians chapter number 3. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. All right, now let's get some, uh, some work out of the way here. A couple things that we would like to say. Remember, the notes, the QR code, if you want the, all of the PowerPoints from all of the messages from Sunday morning right through tonight, they're available. Uh, use that QR code and they will be yours. You will own them. So feel free to do that. We started this series of messages, and it's really kind of one message. It's one theme, and I've been trying to build off this thought from Sunday morning. This is a question that is asked um, uh, of, uh, of a young woman who is crying out for her husband. Song of Solomon, three main characters, Solomon the king, his wife, the Shulamite, and then the chorus of the daughters of Jerusalem. And, the, and, and I've taken the time at least twice to tell the story. Again, I don't want to do that tonight. You can go back to some of the other messages, particularly Sunday morning. You'll get the full spiel, so to speak, and where I'm coming from here. But um, if you remember, the Shulamite's husband knocks on his wife's door. And what takes place is she doesn't initially respond. In fact, she kind of makes excuses. And um, it's kind of like, honey, uh, I hear you knocking, but I got a headache right now. Something like that. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I, I think the husband is looking to uh, have a relationship with his wife. And she just, it, the timing isn't right. Well, as, t as a few a moment or two goes by, all of a sudden she realizes, you know, what am I doing here? I, 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 can, I, I can get up and let him in, but by the time she gets to the door, her husband has said to himself, you know, I really don't want to bother her, and, and he's gone. Well, she opens the door and goes out and is looking for him, and uh, anyway, runs into these daughters of Jerusalem, and what she what she, the Shulamite, does is she asks them, make sure if you see my husband, I'm looking for my husband, I don't know where he went, but if you see him, tell him that I'm lovesick. I want him to come to me. I'm sorry that I repelled him, I pushed him away, but right now I want my husband, I'm lovesick for him. And the question that's asked by those Ladies, is simply this. What's so hot about your husband that you'd come out publicly and ask other people to help you find your husband and you want us to tell people that you are lovesick for your husband? Now, of course, we use that in an analogy that in this particular book, <clears throat> Solomon and the Shulamite represent God, Solomon, and Israel, his bride, or Jesus Christ and the husband, Ephesians chapter 5, and his bride. So we took the question and we said, well, what's so hot about Jesus? Why do we get all excited about Jesus? What's the big deal about him? So my purpose was to answer that question in the messages that I've preached. And tonight I want to bring that to a conclusion, and I want you and I want me to walk out of here tonight when we get in our cars and be better than we were Sunday morning when we came in here. I want you to be a winner tonight. I want you to be a winner tonight. Not everybody in here is going to be a winner. You're just go you're going to stagnate. You're just going to say, you know what? My Christian life's good enough. I really don't need to be any better. And I want you to know this that good enough is the enemy of the best. You understand that? You never come to a, you're never going to be a winner if you're, I don't care what it is, in the financial world, the business world, the athletic world, the af academic world. If you go and you take a course, a history course, and you look at your C plus on your exam, you go, well, that's good enough. I can get my three credit hours with a C plus. You're never going to be a winner that way. So how do you become a winner? Let's go back to the text here and look. And I'm going to give you an alliteration in this message on the letter D. So let's 
let's uh, start out. These are some of the uh, other slides. This is the one I want to get to. Number one, this is the first thing that you have to come to, verse number 12. Paul says this. Now remember, he says that I may know him. He's striving. He has a desire to go forward. But in verse 12, he says, not as though I had already attained. You know what he's saying? I could do better. That's what he's saying. Now, I understand if you couldn't do better, but Paul the Apostle thought that he could do better. He says, not as though I had already attained, that is, reached the goal that I have in my heart, either were already perfect. He says, I'm not perfect. That's why he could be better. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So the first thing is, for you to be a winner, is there has to be some measure of personal dissatisfaction in you with where you are. And that's why I'm asking you, could you be better? Now, if you said yes, you are admitting that you have a gap there between where you are and what you could be or what you should be. Now, see, most of you answered that question, say, yeah, I could be better. My second question, do you want to be better? Now, not everybody will answer that question, yes. See this? See that? You know what that's for? I, I, I'm going to tell you, you're a loser. That's what L is for on my forehead. You're a loser. Good enough. I'm good enough in my relationship with God. I don't need to be any better. I come to church. I read my Bible once a year. I pray occasionally when I eat. And you've got a whole list of things that qualify you to be a good Christian, and it's good enough. It's good enough. We're talking about Jesus now. He's our motivation. That's what motivated Paul here, you know, that I may know him. He says, I haven't attained. I haven't reached that. I'm dissatisfied with myself. Is that not true of every athlete? Is that not true of someone who is a shortstop or a pitcher or a second baseman or a left fielder? They go, they go to practice. Do, how many baseball players bat 1,000? None. Maybe they do the first time they get up to bat. If they quit there, I batted 1,000 last year. I got a hit the first time I was up. But there's always space. I mean... Baseball players in the major leagues make millions of dollars for making seven outs out of ten at-bats. Can you do that? They're kind of like weathermen. You know, they, they forecast the weather and about seven of the forecasts have nothing to do with reality, all right? And three out of ten forecasts, they kind of hit it accidentally. So how does a ball player become better or a golfer or somebody in finance or someone in education? What you do is you have a desire to sign up for the apologetics class, the Acts class, the Romans class. And it doesn't have to be through your institute. It could be over the internet. It could be you buy a book that you want to read to kind of enrich your understanding of some particular topic in the Word of God. But you do that because you're dissatisfied with where you are. Now, I'm not saying you're down on yourself and walking around, I'm going to go out in the backyard and eat some worms. I'm such a failure. I'm, so, I'm not saying that. I'm saying the average person, if you're going to go forward, you have to look at yourself and say, I could do better. I've got room for improvement. I'm a golfer, a professional golfer. Why would a professional golfer, somebody who's a scratch golfer, go out in the morning at 5.30 in the morning and hit 500 drives or five irons? Why would they do that? Because they know they could be better, better. So there has to be right now, if you're going to be a winner, there has to be a certain measure of dissatisfaction in your life for where you are in your relationship with Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? If you don't see that, you can't even identify with Paul who said, I'm not perfect. I haven't attained. I, I, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that 
That is, that I can grab a hold of that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Another question. Do you want to fulfill Christ's will and purpose for your life? Yes or no? Good enough is the enemy of the best. He said, do you want to fulfill God's will and purpose for your life? Do you want to do that? You have to say that. These missionaries that are here, pastors that are here, pastors' wives that are here, and probably many others of you in here, at some point in your life, you had to say, I'm willing. I'm willing to lay aside my agenda, and I'm willing to do what God wants me to do. That's why a baseball player will leave the major leagues and go to Africa. That's why George Grace would leave Eastman Kodak Company and go to First Bible Baptist Church and say, here am I, I'll do whatever you want to do. Anybody, any pastor, any missionary, anybody in the service of the Lord has had to come to a place where they said, Yes, sir, I will do what you want me to do, Lord, and, I'm gonna, and I will do it. Many of us wonder, how do I get where God wants me to be? Obedience, Bobby, obedience. Resign yourself and say, God, I just want to do what you want me to do. And let him drive the car. I sat and listened to Pastor Matovich the other night talk about him working with some men in his church and they were wondering how did you get to become a pastor his story's much different than mine and much different than bobby's and much different than a pastor brown and the other missionaries and many people that are here stories are different why but the thing that was the same as i want to do what god wants me to do I'll do that. And then God directs the circumstances of a person's life. And as long as you have the desire to do what God wants you to do, he will direct you. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That's what the Bible says. All right. You want to be a winner? Or are you just a big loser? You're not dissatisfied with where you are. You think you're doing pretty good. I show up once a month in church. I read my Bible once. I know where the book of Habakkuk is. I could find it in five or ten minutes. You're, I understand dissatisfaction. All right, let's move beyond that. This will go quickly. Look at verse 13. The second thought. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I have, I have not arrived, he says, but this one thing I do, this one thing I do, he dedicated himself. There was one overriding thought and purpose in his life that was more important than anything else in his life. That's why I said, is it important to you that you do what God has called you to do? Is it important? Is it the most important thing? If not, you're setting yourself up, folks. You're setting yourself up. If money is what it's all about, or fame, or position, or wealth, whatever it is, in your, you're setting yourself up for failure as a Christian. You're going to wonder, well, how come God doesn't use me? Because you've never said, I'm open, Lord. Here am I, send me. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And then let God direct the circumstances of life. Dedication. This one thing I do. That's why a professional golfer will be on the driving range at 5.30 in the morning hitting 500 golf balls. Because it's important to him. His golf game is the most important. That's how he's making his bread. That's how he's making his money. That's the most important thing. He eats, drinks. So I heard today that, um, and I don't know the, 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 the truth or, or whatever about this, but Tom Brady and his wife are having difficulties and all that. And somebody said, well, Tom Brady's problem is, is that he's married to football. Maybe he is. I don't know if he is or isn't. But if he's married to football, I can tell you, I know why he's getting a divorce. I can't cheat in my wife with a football. <laughs> she's not going to put up with that. She has to be number one in my life, and she has to know she's number one in my life. 
as far as a human being is concerned. This one thing I do. Well, let's move on. Look at verse 13, and it says, Forgetting those things are which are be behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. If you're going to be a winner, you can't sit around feeling sorry for yourself for what you didn't or couldn't accomplish in the past. You've got to forget that Paul the Apostle was an accessory to murder at best. He had to forget that to move on. To commit and dedicate himself to the Lord Jesus Christ, he had to put that out of his mind, confess it, put it out of his mind, and move on. And he couldn't let that drag him down. You've had failures. Well, you know, me and my, I ended up, I got a divorce, and you know, God will never use me. Poppycock. Don't make excuses. Everybody has problems. Well, you know, my health isn't good enough, and you know, I, uh, God will never use me. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, the things you dedicate yourself to, reach for them. Reach out there and grab a hold of it and do the best you possibly can with that. Don't give up on it. Forgetting the things, well, you know, you know, I was in the minor leagues and I batted 217 in double A ball. You better put it out of your mind if you're in triple A ball and if you're in the major leagues. You can't live back there two or three years before with your failures. You've got to move on. You must move on. This has to do with your direction. Your direction. Where are you going? Let's move to the next word. How about determination? I press toward the mark. That's verse 14. We're talking about being a winner now. What do you have to do to be a winner? That's what this is all about. Or you can be a loser. You can be good enough. Well, I'm doing okay. I'm doing all right. Leave me alone. I'm doing okay. Determination. The key phrase is I press toward the mark. I was, I was alive when this man was the president. Most of you weren't. His name is Harry Truman. Harry Truman, in 1922, was 38 years old. He was in debt, and he was out of work. By 1945, he was the leader of the free world as the president of the United States of America. He had good reasons to just kind of give up and quit. Winston Churchill, who was a great leader of Great Britain in World War II, he never graduated from college or from the university. Did you know that? <laughs> he never graduated from college. How can you be successful if you don't do that? He was told, because of his congenital lisp and stutter, doctors advised him against entering any occupation in which public speaking was important. He ignored what they said, and he did what he thought was right, and he became the leader of Great Britain and brought them through World War II. There's story after story after story of people like that because they had determination. They had determination. No one's going to talk me out of this. I'm going to do the right thing. I am trying to serve God with my life. I'm trying to be obedient to what I see him doing in my life. I'm not going to get discouraged. I'm not happy right now. I don't necessarily like the way things are, but I know I'm doing the right thing. As a senior pastor for 33 years of our church, there were several times over the years that we went through difficult and disappointing things uh, in our church to the point where I could stop and say, you know, I'd like to get out of here. I think I'll go candidating for another church or maybe God's calling me to Africa. I don't, but really, I thought of that. And I thought to myself, God, you put me here. I'm doing what you've called me to do and I'm going to see it through until the end. We'll get through this. By the grace of God, I'm going to do what I believe is right and what you've already shown me is the right thing to do. And right now, it's painful. God brought me through it. 
All of those problems are history. They're gone. They had no continuing effect on me. Now, I know you're saying, well, you're a little crazy. I, that might, I understand that, but I was before I was a pastor. Determination. Doing what God has called you to do. Here you go. Here's another word. Discipline. Disciple. You see the word disciple in there? Paul writes, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. If anything be otherwise minded, God shall reveal it unto you. In verse 16, he says, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Now he's talking about being moral. He's talking about being honest. He's talking about being ethical. He's willing to live within the parameters of legality, morality, and the theology that he understands to be true. Let us walk by the same rule. Discipline, order. A person who's going to be successful has to be disciplined and orderly. You don't get up one time and hit 500 golf balls at 5.30 in the morning and become a professional golfer. You have to stay at it over and over. And you have to come up with some kind of regimen, some kind of system, some kind of system of discipline that you're going to subject yourself to every day. I don't care if you're a bodybuilder, a weightlifter. I don't care if you're working for your master's degree or your PhD. You have to be orderly. You've got to be willing to confine yourself within the rules and regulations to get where you believe that you ought to go. That's how you become a winner. You don't become a winner by doing it your way. Occasionally, occasionally an exception would say, well, I just did it my way. Maybe it's the Frank Sinatra syndrome, I don't know. I did it my way. Yeah, you did. Okay, Frank. All right. I don't know about that, but I do know this. You're going to walk you're going to live by a set of rules and regulations to get or you're walking outside the boundaries and you'll end up disqualifying yourself. Disqualifying yourself. This is how you become a winner. And you say what does this have to do with Jesus? Well, let's back up a little bit in the text. Go back into verse 8 of Philippians chapter 3. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, all things but loss, all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Now, this is what Paul did. He counted everything else in his life as worthless in comparison to knowing Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that everything else was worthless. He's just saying in comparison to, what, to knowing Christ and doing what Christ had called me to do, everything else was secondary in my life. That was the singularly most important thing. That's how you become a winner. You've got to focus on the one thing, excellency. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. When you see people who are excess, uh, successful, and they pay the, pay the price along the way to be successful, and they follow this kind of a recipe, I guarantee you that they suffered somewhere along the way. Go to medical school. You want to go to medical school? You want to go to school the rest of your life? Wait till you're 35 years old before you finally paid off your college loans? Suffer, baby. You want to get there? Then buckle down, man. The day's coming. I know a lot of people like that. They didn't make money. I, I knew one guy who was 50 years old. He was still, still pursuing his doctorate in education. He was 50 years old paying college tuitions. He was willing to suffer to get what he believed was the right thing. That's what you have to do. You've got to suffer something. Oh, yeah, I don't want to do that. I don't want to get involved in that. I'll have to give my time. I'll have to give my energy. I'll have to give up a night. I'll have to give up television. I'll have to... I don't, <laughs> I don't want to do you got to suffer if you're going to be a winner. 
in any kind of competition, you're going to have to suffer to be the leader, to be the winner. Winners aren't overweight who sat around watching TV all summer eating Milky Ways in ice cream. They're not the winners. They're the losers. And our country is filled with them. I heard a statistic today. We can't get enough young men to go in the army. They fell 25% short in their last quota. And one of the statistics was 70% of the young men who are eligible to go into the military don't qualify because they're drug addicts, they're felons, they don't have the education, they're overweight, etc., etc. Only 30% of people, men, young men, are eligible to go into the military. That's scary for Americans, my friend. What are we doing to ourselves? We're talking about young people, 25, 26, 27 years old, who can't pass a physical education test to get in the military. I did. I didn't even try, and I made it in. What's wrong with us? No discipline. No discipline. No purpose. We just do what we want to do. You know what? You know what? Let me tell you. Good enough's good enough. Good enough's good enough. Good enough is the enemy of the best. I'm almost done. I'm looking at the time, and I should be. Verse 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, of God by faith. And then he says, this is the key, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now here's the last word. Desire. I sat out in the gathering area this afternoon. I listened to the two men present the IAM and GCMS ministries, and I counted every time they used the term desire. Desire, desire, desire. A question. How many of you know that you could do better than what you're doing right now as a Christian? Particularly after what we've said here tonight. How many of you know you could be better? How many of you want to be better? That's what this missions conference is all about. Remember what I said Sunday morning? When we walk out of here on Wednesday night, I want the church to walk out of this building better than it was when we came in here on Sunday morning. I said that first thing on Sunday morning just about. Now the question is this. Will we? Will we? I know it's a corporate effort, and it's an individual effort, but it's a corporate effort. Are we going to be a better church after these four days of talking about in Christ alone, having this powerful worship music, listening to these wonderful solos that we have, all of the people have sacrificed and given to make this comfortable for us to come in here, and are we going to walk out of here the same way we came in here on Sunday morning? God help us. God help us. Stop wasting your time. Stop wasting his time. Stop wasting people's time who want to do the right thing, the good thing, the best thing. We haven't attained. We aren't perfect. But we need to strive to be perfect. That I may know him. And that's the key. Do you have a desire to know him? And you need to find out how to get to know him. And the first thing I would tell you is you need to be in God's word regularly. 
and you ought to be with Christian people in conversation, in Bible studies and classes and whatnot, and you ought not to be afraid to talk about Jesus and encourage one another. You ought not to be afraid to, you're not afraid to come to church, obviously, you've been here four days now. God bless you for that. But let's do this. Let's walk out of here better than when we came in here Sunday morning. Now I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. How many of you think you could do better as a Christian? Put your hand up. Hold it there. I want your friends. Look around. I want you to see your friends' hands in the air. I want you to see your family members' hands in the air. My hand's in the air. All right, you can put your hands down. Second question. How many of you have the desire to be better? Don't raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Because that will all come out in the wash in the next few days and weeks. But it's up to you. How many of you really want to be better? That's where the rubber meets the road. Not just, a, well, you know, Pastor, I'm just not perfect. la di die. You're not telling me anything. You know what I want to know? I want to know, do you want to press toward the mark? Do you want to be a winner for Jesus? Do you want to know him? Do you want to get in the word, know Christ? Do you want to be better? And do you want to contribute to the mission emphasis of this church that we've heard about all week and everything you're doing in this mission field in Blue Springs, Missouri? Do you want to do that? Can you be a little better here? Yeah, you already admitted you could be. I don't have to ask you now. So this is what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to have an invitation. Now, again, I don't want to embarrass you. If you would like to, sometimes I like to come forward. I've done that. I'm going to do that at the invitation. I'm going to go forward, not for a show, but for me, because I can be better, and I want to be. And I'm going to invite you to come. If that bothers you, you don't want to make a demonstration, you don't want to publicly stand up and come, that's okay. Would you bow your head, bow your heart, and would you talk to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want to be better. I want to know you. Show me. Guide me. Direct me. Maybe you're just tired of being a loser. You want to go forward and be a winner, a winner. Let's bow our heads for prayer. You respond. I did what I came here for, and I'm going forward. You do what you need to do. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the privilege of sharing your word with these dear people, and they're dear people. They're good people, but I know people. We all can do better. We all can do better, and that's the reason why we've been here these four days is to be better, to do more, to be more connected to your purposes, your will, and what you're doing in this world. So help us now in this time of invitation, we pray in Jesus' precious name, amen. Now, if In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Brown? so bright and so fair and as I entered the gate I cried holy for the angels all let me there
corazón Oh, but then I said I want to see Jesus 